Last week I mentioned a book on the resurrection. I couldn't remember the name of the rest of it. And somebody rightly told us or wrongly told us, it's Richard B. Gaffin, G-A-F-F-I-N, Resurrection and Redemption, a study in Paul's soteriology, formerly known as The Centrality of the Resurrection. It was published by Baker Books in uh, 78 as The Centrality of the Resurrection. And under this heading, Presbyterian and Reformed in 87. Uh, I didn't read it till last year. Um, but it's the resurrection and redemption. I looked in um, Amazon. They didn't, they didn't know it existed and didn't have a copy. Not many books you find that Amazon don't even know exist. So it must be good. Uh, I presume there's a copy in the library. But the ideas of the resurrection that I gave last week, which some felt a little challengingly different. Um, uh, basically, I mean, it's not, I'm not commending this book particularly, but basically he's saying the same thing here um, by Gaffin. But he was a Westminster th uh, seminary, professor of systematic theology at Westminster. And it's just one of those books, and he's one of those kinds of people that you see reference to, but no one engages with. Uh, no one says it's wrong. No one says it's right. It's as if he hasn't said it uh, because it doesn't fit in with what people are expecting. But I think it's got a lot to commend it. Uh, now, this is the last of these six on the theology of two ways to live. But the reason for having these at all is to make sure that you are on board with the theology of the gospel that is being taught through this program, through this system, uh, which called, comes under the name of two ways to live. It's a catechism. If the catechism is theologically wrong, then it is very dangerous. Um, and it, uh, you, you need not to have too much to do with it, or we need to modify it or change it so that it is accurate. So getting the theology first is the first and foremost thing to do. And uh, as I hope you've seen, there is a lot more to it than just the few words that appear on the little so-called tract. That's, that's just the tip of the iceberg. What lies underneath it is a whole theological logic of what the gospel is and its uh, authentic presentation within this framework. The next stage happens uh, in term two. In term two, there's going to be a series of uh, training programs on this. The aim is that by the time you leave college, um, uh, before would be better, that you have this kind of material so much under your belt that whenever and as you find opportunity to minister to anybody, you have something positive to train them in, namely the gospel itself and in how to share the gospel with non-Christian friends. It does two things. So more college graduates should all be not only competent at doing it, not only competent in training people to do it, but actually competent in training others to train others to do it. You, you've got to reach that stage. So as of term two, we'll be running some training sessions uh, on Thursday afternoons from two to three. Um, now, it'll be week one, term two, Thursday 28th of April will be the first of these, and there'll be an opportunity to get three of those training sessions in before college mission happens, which I think you'll find useful when you get to college mission and are expected to share the gospel with people to uh, increase your confidence before that is a thing. Uh, so Thursday two to three is usually the walk-up hour, and anyone who's from evangelism team who hasn't done the course can go on that anyway. But we'll be doing the training session in that period from term to April 28th. If you have questions about it, you could ask Candy, you could ask Tim, you could ask, I don't know who else, Mike. You can't ask him because he's not here. Chris, Chris. you can ask Chris down the front corner uh, about it. Is that right? Um, there we go. Now, let's turn to repentance and faith. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God, the wrath of God remains on him is John 3.36. The place to start, really, in training anybody in evangelism is the end game. Uh, the end game, it's not a game, of course, but it's, 
it, you pick that up from, from the whole concept of chess. There's the beginning game, the middle game, there's the end game. The end game is a different kind of game. The key to understanding how to play chess is how to get checkmate. Repentance and faith and prayer are obviously the important doctrines of the scriptures and they are the end game. But how do you minister to someone into repentance and faith? And what part does prayer play in it? See, boxes one to five in the Two Ways to Live presentation deal with the content of the gospel. But box six is the response to the gospel. It's where the rubber hits the road, where it touches me. And you need to know how to, how to present a purchase proposition. Now, that comes from the world of selling, the phrase purchase proposition. And we are engaged to a certain extent in selling a message and getting people to buy a message. And there's all manner of different purchase propositions. There's the famous puppy dog sale where you say to the people, look, why don't you take it home for the weekend and just try it out, see if the kids like it, right? And bring it back if they don't on Monday and we'll say, get your money back. That's the pop -it puppy dog sale. Or there's the, the two eggs or one sale. Uh, for a long time, there were no eggs sold in milkshakes. There still aren't. But across the egg board persuaded American um, drug stores, which is where they used to sell milkshakes. So I can never what they, you call them a drug store, but never mind. They sold milkshakes. They trained the people in milkshake selling that when someone asked for a milkshake, you reached under the counter and you held up two eggs and you say, is that one or two eggs, sir? Nearly everybody said one egg. But up until then, no one had had any eggs. Uh, in their milkshake. It was an unthinkable thing to put in a milkshake. But as a consequence of it, the egg sales of America skyrocketed. Uh, you offer one or two. Now, I used to use the egg, the, 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 the one or two with my children when I wanted them to get to bed, especially one child who never went to sleep. I'd always say, do you want to sleep in mummy's bed or in your bed? Right? They'd always say mummy's bed. I didn't care which bed they slept in. They could sleep on the dining room floor for all I cared. I just wanted them to get up sleep. So by presenting two, people make a choice. It's an easier purchase proposition than the question of, do you want to go to sleep? No. And then where do you go? So it's a very bad purchase proposition to try and use that one. I worked in Angus and Coots when I first left school for a summer holiday job before university. And we were told we were never to put out three items in the jewellers. It was a jewellery shop. There's still have Angus and Coots. I haven't seen it for years. But never put three things on the table. I, in my foolishness, said, is that because with three out there, people like to steal one? They said, no. It's because if you put three out, they get confused. If you put two out, they say, I like that more than that. Then you put the one they don't like, and then you put another one out like this more than that. But as soon as you put three, they don't buy anything because it's too overwhelming and confusing. And so you've got to learn how to make the proposition to people. One of the great keys to selling in almost every form of selling is silence. Once you make the purchase proposition, you must shut up. That is one of the hardest things, because all salesmen are, are talkers, you see, and so they want to keep talking. The longer you talk, the less chance there is of anybody buying. You need to make the proposition, make it clearly, and then shut up. Because the other person has to make a choice. As long as you are talking, they're not making the choice, they're following what you're saying but you need to let them make the choice. But it's also the most powerful moment because it forces them to take action, either in saying yes or no. As long as you keep talking, they don't have to say yes or no. If you make your purchase proposition and there's a long silence, the person who speaks next loses. Whatever it is, in any conflict or any confrontation situation, this goes beyond just selling here. This is just life, I tell you. The person who speaks next loses. So you say, you know, uh, uh, do you want to go to bed in mummy's bed or my bed? Shut up. Don't say anything. The child now has a choice. Whatever they say now, you can come back at them. But if you speak next and say, well, maybe you'd like to go to, in, you've given away, you've lost. You've got to have the confidence in your proposition. And then you've got to leave it there until the other person responds. When they respond and say, well, I'm not sure yet, you say, well, let's meet again next week. Right? 
they say, oh, I don't know whether Jesus actually, well, good, let's find out. You're still on the roll. But if you speak, you will find that they, you've lost. So you've got to frame your purchase proposition very carefully and then have confidence in it by remaining silent at the end of it. However, the end game is tricky. In chess, it's tricky because there are very few pieces on the board, especially the way I play. There's hardly any of mine on the board at all. But when there's very few pieces on the board, it's actually hard to pin down the other person. And you can go chasing around and around. The two incompetent pl chess players can never get checkmate because it just goes round and round and round. They can't actually work out how to manoeuvre somebody into a position where, if you've never played chess, I can't help you with this illustration. Be merciful and thankful that I wasn't using cricket. But you can't. So you've got to actually understand exactly what you're aiming for. Too much of our evangelism doesn't head towards repentance. Too much of our evangelism is fearful of making the purchase proposition. What if the person says no? And so we do all the apologetics, we do all the argument, we do all the relationship building, we do all the talking about Jesus, and we just almost hope that we're never in the situation where we've got to say, well, what are you going to do about it? But you've got to have that confrontation in evangelism. Because it's a challenge to people to do something, to repent. When you don't have it clear in your mind that you're seeking to bring people to repentance and faith, then the way you evangelism will not lead in the right direction. But the key, of course, is you've got to understand what repentance and faith are. What is the repentance you want? What is the faith that you are demanding? If you're not absolutely clear on those, then you won't head towards them and you'll start bringing in discussions and conversations and social actions and all kinds of other things which are, are good and proper and right in themselves, but they don't actually head towards where you're going. So you, the, you've got to get the really sharp point to your arrow. You need to know exactly where the point is you're heading. What exactly will constitute checkmate? So that you will know how to organise all your conversation towards that point where you're going. Now, you hear it often in sermons. I hear uh, sermons from time to time of different people. And they, they do wonderful work explaining the Bible, but they will not put the acid on the congregation at the end. In fact, very frequently people baptise the congregation by saying, well, we're all Christians here, so... And we don't know they're all Christians here. And we do need to be able to say, well, if you're not a Christian here, this is the implication of this passage for you. And you need to be able to explain it very clearly at that point for them to understand how to become a Christian. So, in summary, the logic of the two ways to live is there for you in the sheet. That last page, you see, we're talking about there's two ways. There's our way to reject the rule of God, try to run our own life our own way, the result is condemned by God. Or there's God's new way, submit to Jesus as our ruler, rely on his death and resurrection, the result is forgiven by God and given eternal life. That is a summary of the previous five pages. That's all it is at that point. Then comes the key question, uh, uh, sorry, and the text is John 3.36, which shows you there's only two ways. And then the question is, which of these represents the way you want to live? Because you're also going to be asking a whole series of other questions. Now, that is why we want to go through this training program with you, of which we have uh, leader's manual and participant's manual because we want you by the time you finish more college, I want you by the time you finish more college, to be able to go through this leader's manual with some other participants. Uh, here in college is as good a place as anywhere to go through. Up at the back of the manual, the last, oh, I don't know, 30 pages or so, is all about the end game. Because what do you say next? When they say, which of these is the way you want to live? They say, B, I want to live God's new way. Well, the next question is, which is the way you're living now? They say, B. You say, that's terrific. You're a Christian. That's marvellous. Tell us about when you became a Christian and, and. Or they say, A. 
He said, well, how do you get from A to B? Let me show you. Or what do you say if they say, well, actually, I want to live like Mr. A, our way. Then you need to know what to respond next. And so there's actually a, a flow chart here at the end of the book, the Appendix 4, which is a big flow chart of showing you if they say this, then you do that. If you say that, then you do this. So that you've actually prepared out your moves before you get to the situation. My brothers and sisters, unless you're a genius, you need to do that. You know, really quick thinkers don't need it. They can just work in the situation. But the best thing is to have that prepared in your head so that you can be flexible later on when it happens in real life. But without that prepared in your head, the flexibility later on in real life hardly ever brings checkmate off. You just chase the pieces around and around and around and around and you don't know where you're going and they don't know where you're going and in the end you have a cup of coffee and go home. Having that kind of thing is clear. Now there's a whole set of other things here of the common questions. You know, how do you know that God exists? Can you trust the New Testament documents? Why God allows suffering? What about the other religions? Aren't all people with little six point answers for you as options for these? And so it, it's at this point that a whole lot of personal interaction on evangelism takes place. But if you've gone through the six pages, you've set the problem up in a way in which you can then control how the conversation heads towards checkmate. Without the six pages set up, you're in open free discussion country. And that's, you, you are not in control of the flow of the conversation. The six pages give you the control of the situation because you can keep on saying, oh, look, look, it's like back at box number three. Or no, your problem is box number two. I'll show you more of that in a moment or two. It puts you in control of the situation, but you still need to know how to play the end game, which critically means you need to know how to bring people to the prayer at the end. So you've got the prayer that I've printed there at your point 1C on the outline today, which is the prayer uh, printed at the end of the... Now, I use this prayer in preaching. I uh, used it very frequently in preaching in the cathedral pretty well most Sundays. I finish most sermons with this prayer because I always assume there are unbelievers there. And if you, as a preacher, assume there are unbelievers there, there will be because people will bring their unbelieving friends when they know that the unbelieving friends are going to be challenged and they won't when they don't. And so the expectation of the preacher creates the congregation that he's preaching to to some extent. So I always finish with this prayer, which meant that I always could explain the gospel in the prayer, having explained it in the scriptures. Uh, this prayer is of a generic nature that generally you can find something in the sermon you've just preached from any part of the Bible which is reflected in this prayer. You won't get it in every passage. Not every passage refers to the death of Jesus or refers to uh, forgiveness of sins or refers to... But week by week, you'll find the passages of Scripture will pick up these themes. So the first paragraph you see there is on sin which doesn't say sin, it's about rebellion, rejecting God. The second paragraph, the two thank yous are thanking God for what his son has done in death and resurrection. And the third paragraph is the prayer of the prayer, asking for forgiveness and change. But more of that later. See, the response to the gospel in the Bible is pretty much the same all over the Bible. It is all over the Bible. It's repentance and faith. There's just the standard thing that constantly is being asked. In the law, you get it in Deuteronomy 30. In the history of the history writings of the early prophets, uh, in Joshua 24, 14, uh, choose you this day whom you will serve. But for me and my household, we will serve. So the prophets of Ezekiel 18, the soul that sins, uh, will surely die. That passage where it says, so repent, God doesn't desire the death of anyone, but that he should turn and be saved. Uh, the Gospels, you see it in John the Baptist preaching and Jesus preaching. Uh, the kingdom of God has come, repent and believe the Gospel. Uh, in uh, Acts, uh, the end of uh, the Pentecostal speech there, Acts chapter 2, 37, 41. Uh, God has made him both Christ and Lord. The people are cut to the heart. Good sir, what will he do? He says, repent and uh, be baptised, you and your household, etc. You see it in the epistles as they reflect upon how people become Christians. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 1, 9 and 10. Uh, everybody talks about your conversion. Uh, all through Achaia, it's been known of your conversion, how you turned uh, to uh, God from idols 
uh, to the true and, and wait for his son from heaven, Jesus, who will rescue us from the wrath to come. So in any and every part of the Bible, see, I, what I've done there is I've just given you one off the top of my head example from each part of the Bible, because repentance and faith is the common thing that is required from you in any and every part of the Bible. This is the expectation of the scriptures. Over and over again, we're called to repent and faith, often using those words, repentance and belief. They're actually the two sides of the same coin, ultimately, but uh, more of that. But there's never the concept of a third way. There's no middle way. See, the concepts we have in two ways to live is there's no middle way. There's repentance, which we call submit, and there's faith, which we call rely. And there's the concept of regeneration, which is found in the prayer. So let's take a look at those. Firstly, there's no middle way. Uh, there never is a middle way in the Bible. People constantly want a middle way, but there isn't one. So people uh, have even spoken of three ways to live. It's the most common objection you'll have in evangelism. People, when you say, which of these best represents the way you want to live, people will say, well, I'm in the middle. <laughs> that's, that's where people want to see themselves. Uh, sometimes I'm this way, sometimes I'm that way. Or I'm not really fully God's way, but I'm not opposed to God either. So I'm in the middle somewhere. Uh, it only adds confusion to talk about religious rebellion as opposed to irreligious rebellion. It's rebellion. Whether it's religious or irreligious is an irrelevance. It is rebellion. It's still the failure to understand box number two. And that is the most common consistent failure, both from the point of view of the non-Christian and sadly from the point of view of the Christian. Because we will not see the depth of the sinfulness of sin, the disease of sin, the corruption that is within us, the, the sin as opposed to the sins, the relational break with God as opposed to the breaking of the rules, the making ourselves autonomous and independent of God rather than living under God. Because we won't see the sinfulness of sin, we find it very hard to persuade people of the truth of the gospel in terms of why God is so stark in his punishment, so costly in his salvation, and why there's only two ways to live. Because people want to somehow have a false middle way. Uh, usually that false middle way is a concept of achievement rather than the concept of relationship. So the gospel is relational, not works achievement. And not taking box too seriously, that all of us everywhere have rejected God's right to rule over our lives. They think they're not totally against God because, well, they acknowledge his existence. But the devils acknowledge, the devils acknowledge his existence. They believe in him and they shudder which is better than you. You believe in his existence and then ignore him. Or they want to say, well, I'm a spiritual person, which just means I'm not a materialist uh, or that I occasionally go to the third world bookshop or something or other. Um, or, or I do some good things. Uh, fascinating. I don't know the case at the moment, really, but there's great confusion in our city at the moment because a man was alleged to have broken into a house and the homeowner is alleged to have killed him. Now, I keep reading more and more about this man who's died. The family is saying, where's the justice? He was a loving, kind, good father. He cared for people and all the rest of it. They're also wanting to say he wasn't in the house. I don't know whether he was. I don't know if he was. I'm just why I use the word alleged. But it's lovely to hear all these wonderful things about this loving, caring, kind father who the other side point out has just been released from prison because uh, he was there because he broke into a house and raped a 16 year old girl. So is he the loving kind father or is he the house breaking in rapist? And the answer is yes. Well, I don't know because it's all alleged. It's all in the newspapers and I know not to believe the newspapers, but could he be both? Yes, of course he could be both. Right? The, the sense that people are all the time only ever sinners in the sense of breaking rules is not true. People don't always only ever break rules. They sometimes keep the rules. 
But even when they keep the rules, they can be keeping the rules in defiance of God. And so they can be still profoundly sinful. Look at John 3.36. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever doesn't obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. The assumption is that everybody is actually under the wrath of God because it's going to rem- it's something you already you're under the wrath of God. It's not that you will face the wrath of God. The wrath of God remains on you. And eternal life is not something that you will have in the future. Eternal life is something that you have in the here and now. So here and now, there are two ways to live. Either you are living, believing in the Son and have eternal life, or you are now living under the wrath of God because you do not obey the Son. It's, it's one or the other. There's no in-between that we are dealing with. Now, to drive home this point, there's all kinds of illustrations. You're either in submission to God or you're not. And so some of the illustrations that uh, I've used and found effective in helping people who understand it over the years are things like married. You're either married or you're not. Uh, there's no reason to doubt whether you're married. I don't stand here thinking, I wonder if I'm married. I I know I'm married. I I knew before I was married, I was single. Since I've been married, I am married. I I do not have... Whether you're a good husband or a bad husband doesn't change the the relationship that you are married. You either are, you're either a good husband, haven't met him yet, or you're a bad husband, which is the normality for husbands. There is, but you're still a husband. The, the quality of your morality as a husband doesn't change the state of whether you are or aren't married. Divorce might change your status, but when you're divorced, you know you're not married. But marriage is not something to have a question mark over because it is a relationship, a certain kind of relationship. You're either in this relationship with God or you're not. And so the other illustration I've used for many years is the good sailor who works on this ship, always does what is right, always, and I've showed this one to you before, didn't I not? Uh, And the key to understand this good sailor, this perfect, wonderful man is, which flag is he flying under? For if he's flying under the skull and crossbones, he's a pirate. He's in rebellion against the government. The fact that he's a good sailor only means he's a better pirate. It means he's advocating rebellion even further and advancing it even further. The which flag you fly under, whether it's under Jesus or under yourself, is the key question. Not how well do you fly the flag. That really doesn't matter at all. So repentance then is the change of mind. It's not feeling sorry, which is what the average Australian thinks. Um, To demonstrate it a little bit is uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, where Paul can speak in verses 8 following, 2 Corinthians 7 verse 8. For even if I made you grieve with my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, for I see that, uh, that that letter grieved you, though only for a while. As it is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly grief so that you suffered no loss. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. The sense of grief, the sense of sorrow, the sense of of feeling bad about something may lead to repentance, but is not repentance. It's like that apology, you know, I'm sorry if you felt bad about what I did. That's not an apology. (laughs) I'm not saying I'm sorry I did it, I'm just saying I'm sorry you felt bad about it. That's really, that's no, that's the apology you have when you're not having an apology. Then you say, I really feel bad about what I've done. Glad, I'm so glad. You still haven't repented. Repentance is changing of your mind. That's the nature of it, metanoia. Uh, the root of it tells you that meta plus noia. It's the mind change that we're involved in. Not that when you go to root of words, you necessarily know how they're being used, but it is how it is used in the New Testament. This, of course, was one of the great breakthroughs for the Reformation because metanoia was translated in the Latin as do penance, which, of course, is completely different to changing your mind. Do penance means do what the priest says in the confessional. So 
you know, go and say Hail Mary 35 times or, or the Lord's Prayer 30 times. That is your doing your penance for what you have done, which is completely different to metanoia, change your mind. Because the change in mind we have here is a change in mind that will change in your will and your directions and your actions. So I used to be single, but I decided to marry. And having decided to marry, I then asked the girl to marry me. When she said yes, I raced through it as quickly as I could, lest she change her mind. And we got married. Actually, we didn't in those days. It took about five years, but never mind. But we did get married. And then I no longer lived as a single man. I didn't, having made all the promises at the wedding, go home to my parents and she went home to her parents and never talked to each other again. It was the kind of change of mind and will that led to change in actions and change your way of living because it was a real and genuine change. I was reading the Kellogg's cornflake packets one day at breakfast and I noticed the percentage of the Kellogg's cornflake which was sugar, which then struck me as a very strange thing because my mother had always taught me to spread sugar over the cornflakes. <laughs> so if it was you know, 30 or whatever it is percent sugar, why am I putting sugar on top of the cornflakes? So I said, these things must be sweet enough to eat without sugar. So I repented of sugar on cornflakes and I just left the sugar out and just ate the cornflakes. Uh, now at that stage I had felt no sorrow, right? but once I started eating cornflakes without sugar I felt sorrow. <laughs> the, 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 the sorrow came after the repentance and for two weeks I sorrowfully ate my, my cornflakes without sugar until one day I completely forgot and put sugar on my cornflakes and then I realised just how sickeningly sweet cornflakes and sugar really is. And uh, so from there, never made that lapse again and I've only ever eaten cornflakes without sugar. In fact, all breakfast cereals without sugar is uh, really where you should be eating uh, because they are so filled with sugar. That is, you can make unemotional changes of mind which are repentances. You can make deeply emotional ones. You can have the emotions before, during or after repentance. Nothing wrong with the emotions. It's just not what the repentance is. It's a really a change in mind that leads to change in actions. Now, very often if you're dealing with sinfulness and people have finally really understood their sinfulness, it can be a very deep and emotional thing. So my experience is that most people are more emotional about the symptoms of their sinfulness than about their sinfulness. They, they're really emotional about the fact they've committed adultery or that they've stolen or that they've told the lie. It's the symptom that really affects their emotions more than the depth of understanding their, their deep-seated rejection of God. There are two sides to biblical repentance. There's turning away from and turning towards. And so you turn away from sin and rebellion and self-government, from autonomy, from false gods, in order to turn to the true and living God. So that's why that 1 Thessalonians passage 9 and 10 is a very useful way of understanding repentance. And it's a model of conversion in the context of that chapter. Because the word Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, your faith in God has gone forth everywhere so that we don't need to say anything. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. It's a wonderful explanation description of genuine conversion. It was turning to God and away from idols. Because repentance is a change of mind from and to. And as we preach the gospel to others, we need to make sure, of course, that we've repented ourselves. But Paul in 1 Corinthians 9 talks about, you know, how he controls himself, lest having preached to others, he himself be condemned. And so you're going to call upon people to repent. Then you need to repent. Repentance is, one th is something that happens once in your lifetime and repentance is something that happens every day of your lifetime. In that regard, it's like marriage. I promised my wife that I would love her on the 22nd of August in 1969. 
I've never felt the need to tell her that ever again. If ever she asks me, do I love her? I always say, check out the witnesses. I said I would. Right? Is not the way for good, happy marital relationships <laughs> to function and not true of my marriage. I will tell her I love her every chance and moment and opportunity I have. I don't have to because I did tell her formally and legally that I would. But because I did, I do. And constantly and consistently do. You see, Mark's Gospel says, take up your cross and follow Jesus. Luke's Gospel in Luke 9.23, Luke 9.23, take up your cross daily and follow me. If you take it up for a lifetime, you will take it up daily. We need both truths. We, we don't live an ideological lifetime. We live day by day. And as we live day by day, we are constantly taking up the cross. So repentance is something we do once for a lifetime and something we do daily. And so when preaching, often I'll have two repentance prayers in the, in the gathering. One repentance prayer is at the end of the sermon where I invite people to become a Christian by praying the prayer of two ways to live. The other repentance prayer is the confession of sins that we all need to do because since we met last week, we've sinned again, haven't we? And so we need once more to ask for forgiveness. One's are once for the lifetime, the others are every Sunday. On the other hand, it could be every day, we don't meet that often. On the other hand, you don't need the two, you could just use one if you wanted to. The, the two clarify the difference between taking up your cross and taking up your cross daily. But clarifying the differences of people, the, the logic is actually not all that different. We constantly need to turn back to God for forgiveness because we do, as a lifetime, need to turn back to God for forgiveness. And we preachers need to do it. You see, we, many times we, we, we've started off, especially those of us who are converted early in life, with a very clear concept of living for the Lord Jesus Christ and turning away from all else. But we don't know what else all else meant until we got older. We had no idea what it was. And as you get older, so the cares and pleasures of the world choke out the word. You see, we weren't the hard rock with the, the seed, the word just bounced off. And presumably we weren't the shallow ground because we've made it for a certain number of years and faced the opposition and we're still here. The real danger one is the third ground, isn't it, for church people and for Christian ministers in that regard. That is the thorns and the thistles that have been planted in our souls and have grown up and we allow to grow up, which slowly and surely choke out the word of God. And so the, the three bedroom career self-fulfilling kind of potential of the overseas trips and the Porsches and all the rest of the, the offerings of this materialistic world slowly and surely choke out the spiritual lives of so many young evangelicals as they get older. And you see it very sadly, but you can see it with ministers of the gospel as well. It's not just them, it's us that can happen. And you often do not know the seeds of the thorns in your heart because the plant hasn't come up to choke it yet. And so I remember being in college and one of my dear friends from university days, uh, had bought a house out, uh, out of Glenory and uh, I was uh, living in Little Queen Street and uh, before they were renovated. And uh, if you call that, anyway, I was down there and <laughs> to the cockroaches. And we went up to visit him and there was his five acre estate with his big house and, and uh, all the rest of it. And envy caught hold of my heart and it was very interesting because I thought I didn't have any materialism in me. It was because I'd never had the opportunity for it. I'd just gone straight from school to university to college. I'd never had earned any money. If you never earned any money, then you don't actually miss that you, what you're doing about money. But suddenly seeing one of my contemporaries and how much he had made and where he was up to suddenly took hold of me. And I had to really recognise yet again another symptom of the sinfulness that is so deep within us. It's opportunity over life that shows you your symptoms. So you've got to keep repenting if you're going to preach repentance. Because rest assured, the congregation will see through you. Uh, your children will see through you. 
and ultimately, hopefully, you will see through yourself with enough time to repent and be saved. Then there's faith. Now, faith is a very simple concept, completely misunderstood by non-Christians and misrepresented by Christians. This makes it really a great difficulty. For, see, Dawkins, he actually calls faith superstition. He'd call it religious superstition, but that's a tautology as far as he's concerned, because religion is superstition. So you can't call it religious superstition. There's a kind of a, a spectrum for what you know to what you believe to what you question, to what you doubt, to what you have faith in, to what you're totally ignorant about. There's this kind of, but see, faith is up towards the ignorant superstition end, whereas knowledge and belief is down towards the, you know, the certainty end. You have all done enough Greek already, I would think, first years may be excused, to know why that must be misrepresenting Christianity from the Greek you know that because the word pistis, duo or pistis is about belief, trust. Yeah. You got one Greek word, pistis pistuo kind of words, right? That is both belief and faith. So to differentiate belief and faith like that means that you're not speaking the, the words that the Bible's talking. You're using biblical words, but you're using them unbiblically. Uh, the, 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 the semantic range is not that great. In fact, it's worse. Why do we use the word believe? It's because it's a verb, and we don't have a verb for faith. I faith, you faith, he and she it faiths. It doesn't work in English, you see. So every time you want the verb, you've got to move into believe language. Because we do have I believe, you believe, he, she, and it believes. And so you've got believe and belief, but you've only got faith. <laughs> so now becomes our problem. You see, it's, it's a linguistic demonstration that the way that, that the world is talking about faith and belief is different to the way the New Testament is talking about belief and faith. Let me tell you some of the things that faith is not, that your average Aussie thinks it is. It's not a religious experience. The word itself is not a religious word. It doesn't fall into that religious category like Eusebeia or Eusebeia do. It's not a feeling. You may have feelings, you may have not, but it's got nothing necessarily to do with feelings. It's not some kind of zot, some kind of religious zot that happens to you. It's not a perception. It doesn't deny facts. It's not jumping in, in against all the evidence. It's, it's not a chopping off your head. It's not a leap into the dark and it's not taking risks. It's none of those things, um, which the world thinks it's all these things. You see, faith is to rely, to depend, to trust or to believe. As we've got four very good English synonyms for the word faith. And frankly, we should use them and get rid of the word faith. I know justification by faith alone is one of the great you know, tugs on the heartstrings of our life, but today it's a menace because it confuses the Christian and the non-Christian as to what justification is all about. For the, you know, the Dawkins, justification by superstition alone. That is not what you mean, but that's what he hears you saying. And the important thing about teaching is not what you say, but what they hear. The message sent is not as important as the message received. If they're not receiving what you mean by faith, then don't use the word. Especially when you've got four perfectly good alternatives. Rely, depend, trust, believe. Perfectly good. None of them are religious. Believe can be a little religious connotation, but none. All of them have the, 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 the uh, res what's the word, the alternative that is reliable, dependable, trustworthy, believable. Because faith has faithful. And so you, you, you solved your faithful problem with any one of those four words. Faith requires an object. And the object of faith is more important than the faith. You see, when someone says, I have faith, you say, that's great. But if someone said, I have reliance, I, ha I depend, 
I trust, you would immediately want to say, in what? What do you rely upon? What do you trust? What do you depend? You should say that with faith too. I have faith. You notice how I had to put in have in order to get the verb form. I faith. In what? In what is your faith? Because the object of the faith is so much more important than the faith itself. And so we rely, we have faith in things or in people or in messages. We have faith. Uh, there are any number of examples. One that I've used for many, many years, which I believe I've invented, but I now see other people use to my amusement, is to actually end preaching, especially with youth group, stand on a chair. I do it literally and physically. I'm not going to do it for you now. Only because we couldn't get it in the TV shot. That's the only reason, of course. And so you stand on the chair. You see, when you're standing on the ground next to the chair, you have not got faith in the chair. To have faith in the chair is not to put one foot on the chair. To have faith in the chair is to put yourself wholly on the chair. So then when you're standing on the chair, you ask, OK, which is keeping me off the ground? My faith or the chair? It's not my faith. That's not keeping me off the ground. I tried to stand three feet off the ground on faith alone. <laughs> I will not make it. It's the chair. The important thing about faith is the thing that you have your faith in, not that you have faith. Um, uh, I, I lived for 10 years in Piemont, in the depths of the western suburbs of Sydney. Um, uh, having grown up in Bondi, I feel anywhere kind of west of Anzac Parade is deeply western Sydney. Um, and so I lived in Piemont. In the block of units we were in, there was a, a lift system whereby when people buzzed you on the front door, they could get to the lift, they could get in the lift, but they couldn't press the button to get the lift up to your floor. You had to press the button for them to get in. And so I had to invite people to step into the lift and wait for me to buzz them up. Right? Now that was a great expression of faith. They had to trust me. I could have left them in the lift. Right? I, I could have tried to buzz them to a different floor. I could have put them down into the cellar. I could have done all. They had to trust me with their lives in the lift. They trusted me, they trusted my word, and they trusted the lift that it would work. It's all faith. It's all trust. That is, the lift is what got them up, not their faith. That's what got them there. Uh, there's any number of things that you can have in the illustrations of what is faith, what is trust. It's whenever you rely upon someone or something. When people say, have you got faith? The answer is yes, of course, as you do too. For everybody has faith. It's just completely normal. Uh, we've used the phrase faith in God for so long that we've left out the in God bit. And so faith becomes a thing in itself. It's not a thing in itself of any value. So you need to clarify. See, James 2 is clarifying the problem for us. For I say I have faith. Show me your faith. How can you, a faith that does not actually change anything is not a faith. It's a, it's a dead faith, which is his way of saying not faith at all. And so you, you don't put Paul against James. Paul would agree wholeheartedly with James. The kind of faith he's talking about is not the kind of intellectual credo, I believe. The kind of faith that saves is the kind of faith that acts. Not that the acts save you, it's the faith in the object. The object is what is saving. And so our faith is not in our works. Our faith is in the Lord Jesus Christ. To have faith in my good works is to have faith in me. To have faith in Jesus' death is to take my faith away from myself. I don't rely upon myself. I don't depend upon myself. I don't trust myself. I trust God and his word and his son for his death and salvation. So Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Um, let me just make sure you're clear on this one. Uh, for by grace you have been saved through faith, 
This is not your own doing, it's the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one can boast. Uh, the this there, this is not your own doing, it's the gift of God, is the salvation, not the faith. Uh, check your gender connections at that point, otherwise you'll get it wrong. However, the faith is that saves is the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But even here you see there is the, the um, abbreviation that you're supposed to understand what you have your faith in. But it is not in your own doing. It is not your in results of works. You must not, you cannot boast. Faith is something that everybody has all the time. This is so irritating about the Dawkins kind of put down of faith. He exercises faith consistently and continually like everybody else. From sitting on a chair to eating food. See, I'm drinking water here. I'm exercising faith. Faith in the person who put it there, they're not trying to poison me. Faith in the person who, who uh, put it through the taps. Faith in the person who's, I mean, you, you're just exercising faith all the time. Uh, you're just trusting, you're alone. If you don't trust anybody, you don't have any friends. Uh, if you don't trust anything, you don't know anything. You, you cannot know something without trusting the evidences, trusting what, your eyesight, trusting your ability to analyse, trusting your teachers, trusting... No one is a blank piece of paper who has worked everything out purely by themselves. It doesn't exist. The tabular razor was never right as a way of understanding human mind and human intellectual activity. Faith is just part of how we live, relying and depending. We Christians are not called upon to exercise blind faith. We exercise reasonable faith. So your faith in your chair is completely reasonable. You've sat in those chairs before. You look at them and they look safe and they look trustworthy. You can rely upon them. It's important thing about faith is that the object, not even the reasonableness of it, is the object of your faith. But you are a fool to put your faith in something that is unreasonable. That is really foolish. And we're not called upon to be fools or to be foolish. But how can you move from sin to Christ? The answer then is actually regeneration. When in sin you are dead and you are blind. So how can you come to life and how can you ever see? It's the spirit in our hearts that lead us to respond to the gospel in repentance and faith. Only by the power of the Spirit can blind men see and dead men be brought to new life. Only by the power of the Spirit can we be born again. For we're not born of flesh or of the will of God, of the will of man, but of the will of God. John chapter 1 verse 12 and 13. John chapter 1 verse 12 and 13. So there is a, a God side to conversion, the regeneration side, to which there is the human results of repentance and faith. God, the initiator, gives us regeneration, which is seen in our repentance and faith. So, for example, in Acts 13, 48, as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. Or in Acts 11, 18, to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. Belief and repentance are the gifts of God in the regenerative process. Philippians 1.29, 2 Timothy 2.25, both also speak of God giving faith and giving repentance. It's part of our arrogance that we think we are responsible for our own repentance and our own faith. And we then slip our conversion into the basis of our salvation, when in fact even our conversion is the gift of God. And there is no basis for salvation other than the Lord Jesus Christ. This doctrine of regeneration will naturally push us down the path of predestination, but then that's another talk for another time. Notice the radical nature of regeneration is a radical change in us which leads to the change in government. We no longer live in rebellion against the government, but we turn away from our rebellion and put our faith in the government that we used to reject. So what do I do to become a Christian? If it's of God, what can I do? Well, it's not really choose. That's not, it, that's, you, know, you can use choose language. It's not unbiblical to do so, but that's not really it. It's better respond. I'm not asking you to choose. I'm asking you to turn back. 
I'm asking you to change, not just to choose. Because when I ask you to choose, you are sovereign over God. It's my choice whether I'll have God or not. But when I'm telling you, you need to repent, then that's not a matter of your choice sovereign over God. That's a matter of you submitting obediently to the word of God. So in two ways to live, what must I do? It's answered by prayer. But pray what? Pray for God to forgive and change me. I can't forgive myself. I can't change myself. Of course, in the very activity of praying, God's spirit is already at work changing me, isn't it? Uh, you answer your own prayer by doing it, in a sense. You pray to God in repentance for God to help you repent. And you pray to God in faith for God to help you to have faith. So the very activity of doing the praying is the activity of repenting and for leaving, though what you're praying for is repentance and belief. The prayer we've printed on Two Ways to Live, you see, has these three, message, three passages, and the logic of it is the logic of the gospel in terms of your sinfulness, a proper understanding of it, a thanking God for what he has done in Christ Jesus, and then please forgive me and change me that I may live with Jesus as my ruler. Now, the implications and the alternatives is what is left. How are you going? Do you want me to just stand up, turn around? Do you want to have a break for just a second, get your mind? Never know how long people can keep concentrating on these things. Just have a little joke here for a moment, if I could think of one. But I can't. There we go for the breakers. Here we go. Here are the implications very quickly. Christianity is relational. It's not moral. It's not legal. It's not religious. It's relational. It's a question of who is the boss. Keeping that clear will head you towards repentance and faith. It keeps you in relational context and saves a lot of problems, especially the subject of sin, you see, becomes important. And to have that one right, you've got to have creation right, to have the creator too. Jesus as Lord is the basis of that relationship. You can't have Jesus as anything but Lord and be a Christian. You must receive him as he is, the creator of the universe, the saviour by conquest. You can think of uh, Colossians 2, 5, 6, 7. Just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, so continue in him. You don't receive him as anything other than the Lord that he is. Three, self-help books and the like and programs and good works programs are blasphemy. They're not just a failure in getting people to heaven. They're blasphemy against the Lord Jesus Christ because they declare that what Jesus did for us was unnecessary and that we could do it for ourselves. Fourthly, we can be sure of our salvation. I'm not sure of what I will do in the future. I'm not sure of my own success. But salvation doesn't rely on what I will do in the future and my own success, but upon Jesus and what he has done for me. Therefore, a mark of understanding the gospel is assurance of salvation. In one sense, it, assurance, you see, is another word for trust and faith, that you have confidence in God saving you, is your assurance of salvation. There was a man called King, it was his surname, can't think of his first name, who wrote a book on the evangelicals, oh, way back in the 50s, 60s, in which to try and help people understand who the evangelicals are, he said that the, the hallmark, the distinctive characteristic of the evangelical is they have assurance of salvation. That is the mark of it. Uh, it's a part of the indication that the new perspective is not evangelical because the new perspective undermines assurance of salvation very deeply and profoundly. Uh, it doesn't give you a gospel anybody can teach to anybody else, but it does take the gospel of assurance out of the hands of the people because you're never quite sure you're going to do the right thing in the future. Uh, a mark of this understanding then, if God sent his son to die for me, while I was still his enemy, how much more, now that I'm his friend, will he save me by his resurrected life? Is the argument of Romans chapter 5 verse 10, if you didn't recognise it, Romans chapter 5 verse 10. The Christian is always assured of salvation. So here's some diagnostic questions to use in evangelism. If you die tonight, would God let you into heaven? 
there's a second one. This, uh, the, uh, this has been used by evangelicals for a long, long time, but the people who have codified it the most are the people who use EE, evangelism explosion. But it existed a long time before them, but they use it a lot. Because there's a good second diagnostic question that follows, you see. That is, why would he let you into heaven? Because if a person's trusting in Jesus, they'll say, because Jesus died for me. But if a person's trusting in their good works, they'll say, well, because I haven't done too much bad. And so you can actually understand whether they've understood the gospel or not on that question. But of course, the people who want to get to salvation by good works, they don't really want to say, God will let me into heaven. They'll say, I hope he would. <laughs> so the first question generally gives away that they haven't got assurance of salvation because they haven't, they're not relying upon the death of Jesus. The second question will even make it more explicit in that regard. I used to say that if anyone starts the second question with the answer, because I, you know they've missed out. I'm sure we need to press a button to get the air conditioning going again, don't we, somewhere along the line? Um, so as soon as they say, because I, because I do good works, or because I go to church, or because I've been through more college, or because I have faith, you see, as soon as you put I as the subject of the sentence, it's what you do that saves you. Whereas the Christian will say, because Jesus, because Jesus died for me, because Jesus rose from the dead. The problem these days is that people have faith in faith. And so their favours answer is because I believe Jesus died for me. And that's still a wrong answer. You're not saved because you believe Jesus died for you. You're saved because Jesus died for you. Because when you say, because Jesus died for me, uh, when you say, because I believe Jesus died for me, your confidence, your assurance lies in your belief, not in Jesus. When you say, because Jesus died for me, your assurance, your faith is actually in Jesus, not in your response. Uh, one of our friends of yesteryear uh, used to say that faith and repentance are not part of the gospel. They are the immediate next things after the gospel. The gospel finishes with the resurrection and its declaration. Your response of repentance and faith is a subsequent thing, it's not the gospel. Now, I think that's overstating the case, but it's a good overstating the case to get us to, to think clearly as to where the gospel is about. Because if you make evangelism about repentance and faith, then what goes before it doesn't matter. Well, that can't be the case. And what comes after is confidence in repentance and faith. When your confidence has to be in Jesus, it's because Jesus that you know that you have faith, that you actually have faith in Jesus, that you have the assurance of salvation. I got uh, tricked on this once by a missionary candidate, a lovely lady, who uh, I said, uh, you know, just testing her out and things like this, why would God let you into heaven? And she said, because I, and I said, wrong, because I knew she was going to say because I have you know, faith in Jesus. She wasn't going to say because of good works. She was much more Christian than that. I said, wrong. She said, oh, I think I'm right. I said, no, you can't be right. If I is the subject of the sentence, there's no way you can be right. It's because Jesus. She said, oh, I think I was going to say the right thing. Uh, I said, OK, well, you finish your sentence. She said, well, I was just going to say, because I have nothing to plead but the blood of Jesus. <laughs> so, you know, you can't really play on grammar rules, can you, ultimately? And fortunately, God doesn't as well and eat humble pie. But why do I tell you that story? Because it helps you understand the point, doesn't it? That's why, not just so as to humiliate myself yet again. Another good diagnostic question is, this comes from Paul E. Little, in your pilgrimage towards God, have you reached the stage yet where you can say you're at peace with God? It's a bad one because it assumes they're heading towards God. It's a good one because they always think they are. But the key part of it is, are you at peace with God? Because, you see, the non-Christian will always say, well, not really. I mean, I, you know, their humility forces them to do it because to be at peace with God for them means they'd have to live a perfect life. And so, no, not really is the kind of answer they give. Whereas the Christian would say, yes, I am at peace with God because of the death of Jesus Christ on my behalf. 
So Romans chapter 5 verse 1, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Billy Graham wrote a very famous book called Peace with God. That's something we know we are at peace with God because we are not relying upon anything of ourselves but of Jesus. Our peace comes from God, from the death and resurrection of Jesus on our behalf. I tried it out with a politician once. It was the only politician I've ever found who told me the truth. An interesting man. He would trying to get me to tell people to uh, vote for him, which I didn't. He used to be an atheist, became a Marxist. Then he actually said he came to believe in God, got rid of his Marxism, changed political parties, was over on the other side, etc. I said, this is great. I said, in your pilgrimage towards God, have you reached the stage where you come to peace with God? And he said, after a considerable pause and long silence, he said, I don't think you can. That's a very good answer. But it revealed, you see, his whole structure of thought was peace with God requires perfection in morality. That's not something you could in this lifetime. So you couldn't. It's a good diagnostic question that brings out then a conversation that can flow from it. Paul E. Little, who is a great evangelist, wrote some really good books. Uh, know what you believe, know why you believe, how to give away your faith. Uh, and was killed in a car accident in his uh, early 40s in America, very sadly. Um, now, there are alternatives. There are many alternatives. You see, the assurance for most people outside of Christianity is an assumption and a presumption. When you say, I know I'm a Christian and I know I'm going to heaven, most non-Christians actually think that's arrogant and presumptive. How can you possibly know such a thing? They hear you saying, I know I'm perfect. And I'm, when actually what you're saying is, I know I'm washed clean and forgiven. There was an interview with Billy Graham in the 1979 Billy Graham crusade by Mike Willisey, who was the big name of gurus on television in those days. And Mike Willisey asked him, are you sure you're going to heaven? He said, absolutely, yes. And he says, well, now, do you believe there are other beings in space? And Billy Graham, who remembers a Southern American uh, states uh, had uh, strange views and started to say, well, if there are people on Mars and they started going on about this and... Most of us who had brought Billy Graham out here, uh, our hearts sunk as we heard him speculating on other creatures in this world and in the universe. But suddenly Willis, he cut him off and said, uh, are you sure you're going to heaven? Because for the non-Christian, that was an infinitely bigger statement than whether there were Mars and moon, you know, Mars and men on the Mars. That, that was a nothing. The idea that you could absolutely be certain you're going to heaven. Uh, Willis, he came from a Roman Catholic background. Of course, that would make it even more impossible for him. And so he peppered Billy Graham about assurance of salvation. And Billy Graham explained the gospel over and over again, which shows that you should pray when watching television. <laughs> the alternatives always involve a contribution. Can't I contribute something? Can't I do something? Go to church, give money, make... And people want to contribute because that's how we've been raised. Thirdly, I want it some of the time, but I don't want it some of the time. You can't have it like that. It's like marriage. You either are or you aren't. You may be not good at it, but you are still married. You can't be a part-time husband or a part-time wife, and you can't be a part-time Christian. Fourth one, it's too quick. How can you? I've been 50 years sinning, and in just to say this one little prayer, and I suddenly am, am saved? Now, in one sense, of course, you can't. Because you're not saved by saying one little prayer. You're saved by the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, which paid the penalty in full. And so it's, it's not quick and easy, but your response is very simple. And then it's the rest of your life. So getting married is very simple. Being married is very difficult. It's, it's uh, just understanding the difference of entering the relationship. Fifthly, what about my future sins? I mean, I've repented from past sins, but I can't keep up the standard. Well, again, it comes back to good works. Good works keep creeping in, don't they? All your sins, past, present and future, are covered by the death of Jesus because Jesus pays for your sinfulness, not just for your sins. The disease is cured. The symptoms continue for some time. As you stand on the last day, the sin you've committed as you died will be forgiven. 
on your deathbed, if you tell a lie, will you be forgiven of that or will you lose your salvation? You see, early church fathers got this very confused and they wouldn't baptise people until their deathbed on the grounds that if you, you know, the last minute you get baptised and you don't have time to sin between there and going to heaven and so you'll be saved. I think it was King, I think it was the Emperor Constantine wasn't baptised till his deathbed for that reason. Uh, it's a failure to understand that we're dealing with a relationship. See, the rules mentality, the morality mentality has not understood the relationship of the gospel. You're not forgiven because you've consciously remembered to say sorry. Because there are more sins than you have committed than you will ever consciously be able to remember, let alone time to say sorry. You're forgiven of your sinfulness, of which these many sins are examples. Another alternative is to say, well, if this is true, why not be immoral? Um, since all sins are forgiven anyway, now you can really go out and enjoy yourself. Romans chapter 6 deals with this degenerate ungodliness. When we understand Jesus' basis of forgiveness, namely the death of Jesus on our behalf and a new motivation for doing good sets in. Previously, the motivation for doing good was to avoid the whip and to get the carrot. But now the whip's been removed and the carrot's been given to us. We have a totally changed, different situation. For now we've been born again by the Spirit of God who is at work in us to produce love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. Now we are actually a changed person. We will not want to be immoral. If you haven't understood that, you haven't yet understood the change. Another one, two more. Jesus becomes your friend but not your Lord. Well, Jesus becomes your saviour by conquering evil and bringing in his kingdom. You can't be in the kingdom without having Jesus as king. You can't be saved unless he is the Lord of your salvation. You can't have Jesus as your friend now and make him your Lord later. He is the Lord. Respond to him, but don't make him. The whole nature of repentance is to accept and submit to Jesus as ruler. Which brings me to the last one, religious association and membership. And the latest form of that, the kind of Catholicism that is now coming into Protestantism, is this, this line about you've got to belonging is more important than believing. It's just old-fashioned Roman Catholicism under a new brand, um, but it's still as wrong as it always was. I'd, uh, it, it flows out of the new perspective, of course. Uh, so we have people saying, I don't need all this because I've been baptised or I've been, co I've been uh, confirmed, dunk, sprayed, sprinkled, wherever it is. So it's always fascinating when you invite people to do Bible study in the streets, etc., you'll have many people say, no thanks, I'm Catholic. And that tells you loads about Catholicism, doesn't it? It's a testament to Catholicism because they don't know the person's inviting them isn't a Catholic. I could be a Catholic priest inviting them to come and study the Bible with me. They say, no thanks, I'm a Catholic, because Catholics don't study the Bible. That's not the logic. I don't have to study the Bible if I'm Catholic, because I'm Catholic. I'm saved, I'm a Christian by definition, because I'm Catholic. Which, of course, can't be right, because if the Jews, who truly were God's people, were not saved by being Jewish, then the Catholics can't be saved by being Catholic. That's not going to, it doesn't work that way. If I... Part of this also you'll see in the community that when Catholics reject Catholicism, they reject Christianity. They don't move to becoming Protestants. They say, if I've rejected the best form of Christianity, why would I take on a lesser form of Christianity? Rather than challenging that Catholicism is the best form of Christianity in the first place, or even Christian as a system. 